Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another webinar on heart healthy eating. Uh, today, the topic is managing sodium intake for a healthy blood pressure. My name is Veronica and I'm a registered dietitian and I'm co-presenting today with my registered dietitian colleague Fatim that I work with at the Toronto Rehab Cardiac Rehab Program. Today, um, well, I guess we can start with the ground rules. If you watch previous webinars, you're aware we have the ground rules. Um, you know, they're simple. The session is for education only. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box like the one featured here. Uh, you can use that Q&A icon to submit any questions you have throughout today's session, and we'll get to it at the end of the session today. Just remember, if you do ask um, questions, they can only be answered generally. If they're very specific to your situation, we would ask that you follow up with a registered dietitian uh, or, or your own um, your doctor or any healthcare provider. So for today's session on sodium and blood pressure, the objectives are um, to understand the role sodium plays in raising blood pressure. We'll recognize the hidden food sources of sodium in our food system, and hopefully you will leave today knowing what foods to include, and um, that will, will help to manage your blood pressure. So not only you know, trying to reduce our sodium, but we'll also try to talk about other foods to include. Great. So I usually start this presentation off by asking the audience, what is blood pressure measuring? So I'll ask you to think about that for a second. Do you know what it's measuring? Blood pressure measures the force applied to artery walls. So the definition of a high blood pressure is that the heart uses um, more force than usual to pump blood through the blood vessels, therefore putting more stress on the heart. We get the two numbers for our blood pressure reading because the top number of the blood pressure, which is called the systolic number, is the force applied to the heart when your heart is contracting. And the bottom number is called the diastolic number. And that number is the force applied to arteries when your heart's relaxing which is why you typically see a lower number at the bottom. Now let's put uh, it into context about how sodium affects your blood pressure. Usually when we eat a high sodium or high salt meal, what happens? We get thirsty. We drink water. Our bodies are smart. They ask for more water to dilute the sodium that you had in the meal in order to keep your serum sodium in target. But as a, as a result, the pressure of the artery walls increases, which puts stress on the heart, making it work harder. And therefore, our goal is to decrease the amount of force and pressure on the arteries, making sure we don't eat excessive sodium is a really good way to manage this. And does anyone know what the target blood pressure should be? The target for individuals living with heart disease is around 140 over 90 or under. And if you're living with diabetes and heart disease, it's a little bit of a stricter recommendation. And it's, uh, or the target is suggested to be 130 over 80 or less in order to prevent damage to not only the heart, but also the kidneys. Now, medication and exercise play a big role in managing your blood pressure, but nutrition can also play a significant role too. There is a very well-researched dietary pattern that we've discussed in previous webinars called the DASH diet. Now, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. The first study happened in, in the 90s, and they took about 500 people. They split them into two groups. One group ate the typical standard American diet, and the other group ate this DASH diet. And what the research showed was that the group that ate the DASH diet, their blood pressure improved within a couple weeks. It actually reduced the systolic blood pressure by 11 points and the diastolic numbers, so that's the bottom number, by about seven points, which is pretty significant. In fact, it's almost as good as some blood pressure lowering medications on the market. So we're familiar that sodium increases our blood pressure. And this DASH dietary pattern is a lower sodium eating pattern because it includes a lot of whole foods that are naturally low in sodium, uh, which helps keep the sodium in check. 
But the other thing with this dietary pattern is that it focuses on increasing other foods like vegetables, fruits, low fat dairy, legumes, nuts and seeds. And these foods actually increase some minerals. And the minerals are potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And these minerals have been shown to help further improve our blood pressure regulation. So to improve our blood pressure, we not only want to reduce the sodium intake, but we also want to increase our intake from foods, from plants, uh, in order to meet our needs of those minerals, of potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And if you look at the foods on the screen here, you'll notice that they're similar to the foods we have been recommending in the Mediterranean dietary pattern as well. So now we know it's important to reduce our sodium intake, but by how much? Well, our body needs about 500 milligrams of sodium per day for general metabolic reactions like fluid regulation. And it's not realistic to have a goal of zero milligrams per day. Uh, you know, we need some sodium in our body and we can't really function without it. The adequate intake for adults is around 1500 milligrams per, per day, which is about three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. So remember the, the teaspoon is the smaller measuring spoon. So it's not a lot uh, of salt that um, is recommended. Now, if the adequate intake is about 1500 milligrams per day, how much do you think the typical Canadian is eating in a day? The research is saying almost 3600 milligrams, which is you know, more than double the recommended adequate intake for the day. So there is a lot of room to reduce the, the sodium that we, we do eat. There was another nutrition research study that was conducted about blood pressure and our diet. And this one just restricted the sodium to about 1500 milligrams. It didn't increase the other minerals like potassium, magnesium, and calcium, which was done in the DASH trial. The study that just looked at sodium still reduced our blood pressure, but not as much as the DASH diet did. So it reduced the systolic or top number of the blood pressure by about five or six points and reduced the diastolic number or the bottom number of the blood pressure uh, to about two or three points. Now, before I flip to the next slide, I'm gonna ask the audience a question. So please participate in the chat box if you know the answer, uh, but just think about um, where our sodium is coming from in our diet. So does anyone have any response to that? Do you know where most of the sodium that we're eating is coming from? Just wait a second to see if anyone can type in the chat box here. Great. Potato chips. Uh, good. There's answers coming in, which is great. Processed foods. Um, and yeah, from food, exactly. And from processed food, yep. Yeah. Fast food, from cheese, from bread. Wow, these are excellent answers. And, and that's it. It's the processed and restaurant meals that um, most of the diet, most of the salt is coming from. So when we look at this pie graph here, the salt shaker, it only represents about 10 to 25% of the, the sodium in our diet as Canadians. So it's great if you get rid of your salt shaker, you know, at the dinner table or when you're cooking your meals, but it's only a small chunk of the big pie. The bigger part of the pie is the processed foods and the restaurant foods. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, in the chat box there, there was bread that was suggested, potato chips, a lot of packaged products um, do have sodium added to it. So thank you for contributing to that. Now let's look to see how much sodium is added when a food is processed. So we can take a tomato as an example. And you know, one medium tomato has about 14 milligrams of sodium naturally present in it. If it's processed into canned tomatoes, half a cup, so a similar serving size, has about 300 milligrams of sodium. So that went up pretty high for just canning tomatoes. Half a cup of tomato juice has about 440 milligrams of sodium. And then half a cup of, pot of spaghetti sauce has about 750 milligrams of sodium. I know this is something that 
Um, a lot of people do. I even do. It's this you know, spaghetti is a really easy weeknight meal you know, to open up a can of of sauce and put it on some noodles. That would be something that's uh, common. And when we think back to our adequate intake for the day, remember it was um, or we're aiming for about 1,500 milligrams, which means that half a cup of tomato sauce is actually half of our adequate intake right there and sometimes you'll have more than half a cup so trying you know to find lower sodium choices um, with these higher sodium items and then the last um, example here is ketchup so half a cup of ketchup is about 1300 milligrams of sodium i know we probably wouldn't eat half a cup of ketchup at once uh, but we're just keeping the serving sizes the same here just to show you that you know sauces uh, do have a lot more sodium added So why do you think sodium is being added to meals? Well, we obviously know for preservation, which is what's shown here, but it's also for taste. The funny thing about sodium is the more sodium we eat, the higher our threshold is, um, is set to, and therefore we require more salt to satisfy this new you know, threshold. And this is why the majority of Canadians are happy with the amount of sodium found in processed meals in our food system because we're used to the amount of sodium. But the fact about sodium, um, this fact, you know, can actually work to our advantage because when we reduce the amount of sodium we consume, we can actually reduce our sodium threshold or those taste bud thresholds uh, and it will, can reduce down and we will eventually be satisfied with a lower sodium diet. Uh, you know, it does take a, a, a some time. So you want to make sure that you stick with it, but it will get easier if you haven't tried it already. And maybe if you have tried reducing your sodium, you and you have noticed this. So we mentioned most of the sodiums coming from processed foods, but also restaurant meals. So is there anything we can do to reduce the amount of sodium when we're dining out? Well, a lot of the sodium is found in sauces and gravies. So perhaps you could ask the waiter to forego the sauce or maybe ask for it on the side. And you have to also be wary of some of the healthier options, you know, like soups and salads. For salads, it's actually the salad dressing that is high in sodium. So perhaps, again, you could ask for this on the side to control the amount that you add, or you can even ask for the, you know, oil and vinegar to be delivered to your table so that you can make your own dressing. You know, soups, unfortunately, are, are usually high in sodium, um, and there's not a lower sodium option at restaurants. What else could you do? You can make requests. So ask your waiter, your waitress, um, what are the options? You know, you can tell them that you're watching your sodium intake, you know, that they're there to make you happy. So if they can do something for you, they, they will. Maybe they can offer you something that's not on the menu. Maybe they can talk to the chef and the, the chef doesn't um, add the extra salt at the end of the meal. You can watch portion sizes. What do we know about serving sizes at restaurants? They're huge. So can we share entrees? Can we ask for lunch portions instead? Uh, perhaps we could ask for half of it to be wrapped up even before it comes to our table so that we can take it home for our, uh, you know, a dinner meal or, or a meal the next day. And then you can always ask for the nutrition information. So for fast foods, uh, like fast food chains and other chain restaurants, especially the ones that have the calories written on the, the menu board or the menus, they will actually have a brochure of all of the their menu items and a list of nutrients, um, including sodium for each of those menu items. So you could ask your waiter or waitress for this brochure, um, but it's also likely listed on the internet. So you could do some research before you visit the restaurant in order to choose a, a healthier option. Okay, so here's a pop quiz. And feel free to um, contribute in the chat box if you can or if you have an answer to this. But how much sodium do you think is in this meal? We have two slices of whole grain bread, two poached eggs, there's some bacon, some tomatoes, and mushrooms there. Let's see if there's any guesses. There's a guess of a thousand milligrams, another guess of 2000 milligrams, another one of 1800, 1500. Awesome. So let's see. 
it's 1100 milligrams. So you think it's a pretty healthy meal when you're ordering you know, breakfast out, you're choosing whole grain bread, poached eggs, but this is actually 75% of our daily sodium intake in just one meal. And um, where do you think most of the sodium is coming from in the meal? A lot of the time people say the bacon, which is true, bacon is a high sodium food, but the bread, now bread is actually one of those hidden sources of sodium. Uh, one slice of bread could have, you know, 200 to 300 milligrams in, of sodium just in one slice. So if you have a meal of two slices of bread, like this meal, that could be almost 600 milligrams of sodium. So it's something to try to just pay attention or increase your awareness that when you are eating bread, check the nutrition facts label and see if it's a low sodium bread. If not, then perhaps it's something to look for when you're at the grocery store next. So we have a second quiz question. How much sodium is in this bowl of soup? So this, you know, it's one cup of vegetable soup. It could be a restaurant meal or it could be, um, you know, a can of, of soup. Does anyone have any comments about this? Any idea? One cup of soup. I see a quarter of a teaspoon, about 500 milligrams. Another answer is about 2,000 milligrams. Another one of 1,000 milligrams. Great, thank you so much for contributing. So it's one cup. So remember, one cup isn't that big of an amount, um, but it is still a significant amount of sodium at 900 milligrams, or about 61%. And as I said before, it's hard to find uh, or ask for a low sodium soup when you're at the restaurant because it's usually pre-made. But when you're at the grocery store, you could uh, look for soups, you know, in glass jars. Um, usually they're in the refrigerator section of the grocery store, you know, in, in the fresh produce aisle. Um, sometimes they're in the, those glass jars there or sometimes in bags I've seen as well. And, and they're usually lower sodium. Uh, or the other thing you could do to make a lower sodium soup is to actually make it yourself at home and we have a fantastic minestrone soup uh, recipe actually on our website cardiac college so if you haven't uh, checked that out i do recommend it it's with a longo chef um, so it does you know it's, it's pretty tasty and then the last quiz question we have here is two and a half dill pickles so how much sodium do you think is in do two and a half dill pickles so some answers are coming in 500 milligrams, 700 milligrams, 850, 850. Great, good answers. But guess what? Two and a half dill pickles is actually 1,500 milligrams. So that's 100% of your daily intake, if you can believe it. I'm not trying to scare you to say, you know, you can never have pickles again, uh, but it's just again to increase your awareness that this is a higher sodium choice. And maybe if you're craving pickles, you know, have one pickle, enjoy it, and then watch your sodium intake for the rest of the meals, uh, your meals for the day. Uh, on the slide here is just some other foods that are higher sodium. So that includes, you know, olives like pickles, they're in a brine, so they're higher sodium. Uh, higher sodium options. We talked about bread, so the bagels here, so it's not just sliced bread, but bagels or other pastries. Uh, we talked about ketchup, so you know, sauces are, are down at the bottom. Um, and we spoke about soups as well as uh, soy sauce. So think about soy sauce. One tablespoon of soy sauce is about 1,000 milligrams of sodium. Uh, there is a lower sodium version of soy sauce, but again, one tablespoon, 660 milligrams of sodium. So it is quite high. Um, again, just trying to increase your awareness that this is where our sodium is really hidden in our food system. So I'll pass the presentation on to Fatim um, and she can talk to you about flavoring foods without salt. Okay, great, thanks, Veronica. So we know that uh, salt adds flavor to our foods and we kind of in North America become accustomed to uh, food that's uh, flavored quite heavily with sodium and we're used to food tasting good. Um, when you cut back on salt, you don't have to get rid of that flavor in your food, but you wanna look for alternatives um, to salt. So, you know, feel free to use um, all your herbs, your spices, um, whether it's cayenne or any dried herbs, fresh herbs. Uh, you can use garlic, ginger, uh, lemon juice, vinegar. There are a lot of nice ways to flavor your foods without the salt. 
And uh, one of the bonuses of using all these herbs and spices is that many of them are very high in antioxidants, which we know are very good for us. So uh, we're cutting back on the salt and we're increasing our antioxidant intake as well. If you go into the grocery store, you might have noticed um, some spice blends. Um, so things like Mrs. Dash or McCormick's or there's a company called David's uh, all have uh, salt-free seasoning blends. And these are just basically uh, different combinations of dried herbs and spices that you can use in marinades or shake onto your foods before you cook them or even after cooking to add flavor. Um, if you look on the Cardiac College website, under the sodium section, we also have some great recipes for you to make your own seasoning blends. And there's also a nice table there that tells you what herbs work with what types of foods. Um, so go ahead, spice up your foods. Um, the one thing though that we do caution against are things that are called salt substitutes. So you might've gone into the grocery store and next to the box of salt, you might've seen a little jars called no salt or half salt. And regular table salt or sea salt is sodium chloride. And these salt substitutes are potassium chloride. And just as you can get too much sodium using the regular salt, you can also end up with too much potassium from these salt substitutes. And that's dangerous for your heart. So try to avoid those substitutes, um, but use lots of different herb spices, uh, garlic, lemon, different ways to flavor your food. Now, uh, if we look at labels, and uh, we did give a talk on label reading a few weeks ago, but just to summarize what to look for in terms of, of sodium. So when you are choosing, for example, a can of vegetables or beans or even fish, or maybe a carton of broth, what you wanna look for are things that are labeled no salt added or low sodium. Um, the no salt added would mean that there's no extra salt added other than what's naturally there. And then the low sodium would mean no more than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving, so quite low. Um, if you're looking at the nutrition facts panel, and I know there was a question that came up about converting grams to percentages. Well, if you look on your, your package under sodium, you'll see sodium listed as um, milligrams, but you'll also see that percent daily value or percent DV. And for sodium, you try to look for foods um, that are 5% or less daily value. So for most of the things you're eating, if you keep to less than 5% over the course of the day, uh, you'll still be under that 1500 milligram target. And then lastly, if you look on the ingredient list, um, sometimes salt is listed just as salt, um, but there are other things that contain sodium. So um, things like MSG, which is monosodium glutamate, or sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. Those might not have as much uh, sodium as your regular salt, but they do still contribute to that total sodium in the product. So if you see that word sodium in the first few ingredients, um, that's a hint that this product is probably high in sodium. So I know we're in a, a strange situation right now with COVID-19. Um, a lot of us um, are not grocery shopping the same way that we usually do. Um, you might not have access to a lot of low sodium products. Um, oftentimes in the grocery store, there's less selection. And if you do end up with, say, a can of regular beans or chickpeas or, or canned fish um, that has the salt in it, what you can do is drain off all the liquid and then give it a quick rinse under cold running water. And you might not get rid of all the sodium, but you'll get rid of about maybe 30 to 40 percent of it. So still worthwhile to do. If you can find low sodium products, those are worthwhile. And the example we have here is of the salmon. So the first one at the top is the low sodium. And if you take a look and uh, look at the ingredient list first, you'll notice that there's only one ingredient. It's just wild red sockeye. And if you look at that sodium number, it's 85 milligrams or 4% of your daily value. So pretty low, and it's just the natural sodium in the fish that you're getting. Now, if you look at the regular sockeye salmon on the bottom, you'll notice with the ingredient list, now we have two ingredients. We have the wild red sockeye, and then they also added salt. And look at that sodium number. It's 440 milligrams or 18%. So quite a big jump from the 85 milligrams in the low sodium version. Um, so if you do find 
the low sodium products, it is worthwhile to buy those. Um, sometimes patients say, well, I'm not used to the, the flavor with the low sodium. And that's where, again, add a squeeze of lemon juice, maybe add some pepper, um, even a tiny pinch of salt on your own would probably be a lot less than the pre-salted variety. Uh, let's move away from sodium and talk about um, the other foods that were mentioned in the DASH diet. So Veronica mentioned uh, increasing other minerals such as potassium, magnesium, and calcium. So let's take a look at each of those. So if we start off with foods that are high in potassium, uh, we know that potassium is important in terms of maintaining our body's fluid balance. Um, it's involved in muscle contraction, um, nerve impulses, and it's also crucial in terms of maintaining a healthy blood pressure. Um, potassium's a, a relatively abundant mineral in our foods. Um, things like fruits and vegetables are especially high in potassium, and you might have heard of things like bananas or potatoes being very high potassium. But you also find a lot of potassium in other heart-healthy foods, like your whole grains, uh, your nuts and seeds, and also your dairy foods. So I think the key with potassium is uh, try to get in your seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, but also include a lot of other things like your whole grains and nuts and seeds on a daily basis. If we move on to magnesium, uh, Magnesium is actually a cofactor in hundreds of different enzyme reactions in our body. It's involved in muscle function and nerve function, and again, also in blood pressure management. Um, so we know, um, again, a lot of heart-healthy foods, and all, especially those that are high in fiber, tend to be also high in magnesium. So if you think of things like your beans and lentils and chickpeas, all your legumes, those are an excellent source of magnesium, um, all your nuts and seeds. So whether it's walnuts or almonds, pumpkin seeds, um, sunflower seeds, those are also great sources of magnesium. And then your whole grain. So when you think of whole grain breads or cereals, your whole wheat pasta, brown rice, quinoa, those are all excellent sources of magnesium. So again, think about variety and how you can incorporate these foods on a daily basis to hit your magnesium target. And then lastly, we come to calcium. And I think from our experience, um, most patients have a harder time getting enough calcium than most other minerals. Um, if we look at the, the goals for calcium intake, uh, most adults need between 1,000 and 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day. Um, when we look at dairy foods and dairy substitutes, um, a glass of milk, or a glass of almond milk or soy beverage would give you about 300 milligrams of calcium per day. So, you know, it is important that you get in um, at least two to three servings of these foods, and then also include things like uh, yogurt or kefir, um, maybe a low-fat cheese to get your calcium in. Um, when you think of alternatives to those dairy and dairy uh, substitutes, you can also think of things like that canned salmon. So uh, half a can of canned salmon would give you about 200 milligrams of calcium. And then when we think of our leafy greens, it's much harder to get enough calcium from things like broccoli and kale. Just to give you an example, if you were to eat half a cup of cooked kale, it would give you 95 milligrams of calcium. So you'd need to eat an awful lot of these greens to hit your 1,000 to 1,200 milligram goal per day. But definitely, you know, it is part of that total calcium intake. So again, try to get the variety in, but also consider getting milk and alternatives in at least two or three times a day. Now, when it comes to calcium supplements, um, I often get questions about, should I take a, a supplement because I'm, I'm not a big milk drinker or I don't like milk? Um, and as with all vitamins and mineral supplements, you always wanna to speak to your doctor first before you start taking a supplement. Uh, the research does show that if you do take very high dose calcium supplements for the long run, you can actually do more harm than good, uh, especially when it comes to your heart health. So you don't wanna go out and just start taking a high dose calcium supplement. You wanna to speak to your doctor or your pharmacist and figure out the right dose and the right timing for your calcium supplements. And so the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was alcohol. So we haven't really mentioned that too much so far in our talks, but we do know 
um, that alcohol can also increase your blood pressure. It can also increase your triglycerides or that storage fat. Um, and the current guidelines for alcohol intake um, suggest that you stick to no more than one to two drinks a day. For men, less than 14 per week and for women, less than nine. Um, it's also highly recommended that if you don't drink, you don't start. Um, and that's also a, a recommendation for not just heart health, but overall health from the World Health Organization. Oftentimes, we'll have people come and say, well, my doctor says I can have one drink a day. And we have to look at portions. So it's not exactly what this gentleman here is doing. So when we're looking at the guidelines and we're looking at what the portion sizes are, we're actually thinking about more in terms of a 12 ounce beer, or a four to five ounce glass of wine, or an ounce and a half of hard liquor as being one portion, um, as mentioned in those guidelines of no more than one to two per day. So just some things to reflect upon. Uh, again, as I mentioned, um, we are in a, a different situation right now with COVID-19. I think one of the, the benefits is that we're at home more often and a lot of us are cooking home at home and using fresh ingredients. Um, and that's great in terms of reducing your sodium consumption. But other things you might consider are how often you rely on frozen or prepared foods. So it might be something like a frozen entree or a frozen pizza or maybe an instant side dish. Also think about how many times a week um, you're ordering in. We might not be eating out so much, but um, a lot of us do get takeout and uh, restaurant foods, um, as Veronica mentioned, tend to be higher in sodium. So think about how often you're doing that and are you asking for lower sodium options or looking at their um, nutrition information before you order. Um, you might also consider how often you eat processed meat from the deli. And then if you are buying things in a can or a jar, are you looking for the ones that are labeled no salt added or low sodium? So just think about those. And then maybe think about one small change you can make to reduce the sodium in your diet. Now for some of you, you may already be uh, trying to eat a low sodium diet and that's great. Um, and in that case, maybe consider your potassium, and your magnesium and your calcium intake. Are you at your targets for those? And then again, think of small changes that you can make to make sure that your minerals are all in balance. So our take home message, try to eat at home more often. I think we're all doing that lately. Um, don't order in too often. And with that, I will open it up to questions. I know quite a few have come in. Yes, thanks Fatim. That was excellent. So I have some questions here, which is great. Thank you for contributing. And if you do have any questions, uh, please submit them through the Q&A uh, icon app, not the chat box. If you could use the Q&A, that would be great. So I'm reading a question here. How much sodium is in a farm fresh egg? Um, truthfully, I don't know exactly how much sodium is in an egg off the top of my head. I'd like to say it's around 80 to 100 milligrams. Uh, but when you think of, you know, whole foods, the ones that we recommend, you know, a lot of plant foods, um, and, and whole foods is an egg, or, or I guess egg is considered a whole food. Um, generally, these foods will have sodium naturally present in it, but they're very, you know, they're in low amounts, like, uh, like I said, around 80 to 100 milligrams. So they don't um, contribute excessively to your, your sodium intake for the day. So when you're thinking about whole foods, don't worry too much about them. Um, it's more of the packaged processed uh, foods that you want to pay attention to. And those are the foods that actually have that nutrition facts panel on it that you can uh, read and find where sodium is and how much sodium is in there and look for that percent daily value that Fatim was talking about. Great. So there's another great question that came in. What's the difference between sea salt and regular salt? And that's an excellent question. So I think the type of salt you choose is a personal preference. Uh, but when it comes to sodium, when you look at the amount of sodium in sea salt versus regular salt or kosher salt, they're actually all pretty similar. And uh, a teaspoon of salt, um, any type, is roughly 2,300 milligrams of sodium. 
So not too much difference between the different types of salt. Um, you might have a preference in terms of the taste of one type of salt over the other, and if you're gonna use less of it, and that's great, but sodium-wise, they're all pretty equal. Awesome, thanks, Fatim. Another question here is about um, the 1500 milligram recommendation. Question says, is it recommended for everyone, such as a non-cardiac person or someone with good blood pressure? And the 1500 milligrams of sodium, that adequate intake number is actually for the whole you know, Canadian population. Um, as you, you know, heard me say, as Canadians, we're consuming around 3,600 milligrams um, a day. And so we are, you know, excessively eating sodium. So it, it is something that we are encouraging, you know, everyone to watch how much sodium um, and the, the adequate intake is, um, is a number that's from something called our daily reference intakes uh, or DRIs. So it's you know measuring all of Canadians, not just uh, individuals living with uh, cardiac conditions. Um, you know, the, they're saying that the upper limit or the most sodium anyone needs in a day is actually around 2,300 milligrams. So that would be the maximum. Um, but this 1,500 milligram that they're recommending is, is ideal for everybody. So I hope that helps. Okay. So the question here is, monosodium glutamate or MSG better than sodium. So as I mentioned, um, MSG still contains that sodium. Um, just to compare, um, MSG is about 12% sodium, whereas a, your regular table salt would be about 40% sodium. So it is a bit lower, but it is still part of that sodium intake. And so I think, you know, again, if you're having, it depends on the quantity. If you're having too much of it, it could be just the same as having the salt. Um, there are also uh, certain people who are more sensitive to MSG and um, it can trigger things like headaches or migraines. Um, but I think you wanna look at that big picture and maybe think of that 1500 milligrams as your budget per day and then sort of try to balance it out with the salt and other things that contain sodium in your diet. Great. Another question here reads, if you eat fresh fruits, homemade bread, vegetable, nuts, chicken, garlic, you will get nowhere near the 500 milligrams a day minimum. Um, is that an issue? And when you're looking at, or when you're including just whole foods, like the ones that you described, mainly plants, um, you know, as I said, they do have some sodium naturally present in these foods. So you're likely to actually get around 500 milligrams a day, which is, is the minimum, but we still do suggest trying to aim for that 1500 milligrams. Um, you know, like I said, our body needs at least 500 milligrams a day and um, that 1500 milligrams is, is more realistic. Um, so if you are just eating whole foods, you know, no processed foods, no restaurant meals, and you think that you're not consuming enough sodium, that's maybe perhaps when you would talk to a registered dietitian, they can do an analysis of your, your food, like your eating pattern, and, and see how much actual sodium you're eating and um, make a plan for you going forward. Okay. So a question came in, is taking a daily magnesium supplement a good idea? So again, with any type of uh, vitamin, mineral supplements, um, you always want to consult with your healthcare provider before you start one. And I think as dietitians, Veronica and I um, tend to recommend food over supplements. So uh, try to get your nutrients mostly from your food rather than relying on supplements. So you know, with the magnesium, can you get in you know a handful of nuts and seeds every day, or uh, start your day with a whole grain bread or cereal? Um, maybe incorporate those legumes, those beans, lentils, and chickpeas a few times a week. That would be um, enough to give your body adequate magnesium. Now, if you do have uh, dietary restrictions or other conditions and your magnesium levels are low, you want to speak to your doctor before you take a supplement. Great. Another question about uh, what causes white coat hypertension? Uh, so what White coat hypertension or, or high blood pressure is usually something that um, happens when you go see a doctor and you're getting your blood pressure measured by the, the doctor. 
sometimes they have um, or you, you have a higher blood pressure reading at that time because sometimes people appear more anxious or worried when they're getting their blood pressure measured or even just going to the doctor you know you have more anxiety at that, that time and those things anxiety and stress can actually increase your blood pressure um, so that's why it's called white coat hypertension because you're seeing a doctor who's usually wearing a white coat um, if you think that that's happening to you, that's something definitely to talk to your doctor about and um, getting a blood pressure measuring um, device that you can be at home measuring your, your blood pressure throughout the day to see um, how high or low it, it goes. Okay, so there's a question here. You're only, you know, eating at a, a buffet or knowing that you're going to eat high sodium foods and it's only a couple of times a year, I would just say enjoy it. Uh, if you're at the buffet, you might also want to make sure you include a lot of those uh, fruits and vegetables uh, just to try to get in uh, some of the other nutrients as well. Um, but, you know, it's all about balance and, and the big picture overall, sort of what you're averaging. So if on most days you're on target, that's great. Um, once in a while, I think we all um, tend to uh, overdo things um, as long as it's not too often. I think twice a year is more than reasonable. Awesome. Thank you, Fatim. So I think that's it. We answered most of the questions, but there, I think there's four or five that we didn't get to. Uh, we'll write a response and post it on the website for you to review. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining today and for contributing to those questions. They're awesome. Uh, tomorrow's session is actually a walk and talk with Rob. So it's a new format that uh, we're going to try for the June sessions. It will occur every Tuesday and Thursday. It's going to be a 30 minute exercise session, which includes stretching, aerobic exercise, as well as two to three resistance exercises. So I uh, hope that you can tune in and enjoy that. Um, there is also um, uh, our Women with Heart online series. It's um, going to be with Lauren. Um, that's going to be next Tuesday. Lauren's one of our cardiac rehab supervisors, and she's going to take you through an exercise, a live exercise session um, as well. So we hope you can attend those too. And we will be here again next Wednesday to talk about um, all things nutrition and heart. Um, but thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. Thanks, Veronica. And thanks everyone for joining in.